Hi, it's Joe Lines from The Automator, and this video is an extract from our Udemy course on Intro to GUIs with AutoHotKey. And uh, we, we've, we're making this available. We're, we've taken about an hour of the course, which is, I think, around a third of the course, um, some of the, the best parts of it, the things that uh, most people would really like to know, and put it into this video, and we're giving it away. Um, and, uh, you know, if you find value in it, there's still, there's two-thirds of the course that isn't in this, then I would say go check out. Also, if, uh, you know, if you really like to to be able to compartmentalize and have them into small videos, most of the videos in the Udemy course are, are three to five minutes. So it's it's much more broken down and simple to work through and kind of see where you are in the structure. Uh, however, you know, it's it's not a must. You can watch this video and get a lot of value out of it. And, uh, and I have a lot of other videos on, on doing GUIs and stuff. Uh, but... Um, consider, you know, purchasing the course at some point. You don't have to, though, right? Um, the the Auto Hockey Help has a lot of the stuff that we cover in here as well, so just go there and use that. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to check back in a couple times with you to remind you about um, this. And uh, again, the, so this link above me here, that gives you a coupon to get the co uh, the course at a discounted price. Um, so it's a great thing to be able to, you know, save you money. And it's actually, we earn more money if you use the coupon. So it's kind of a win-win for both of us. Uh, otherwise, Udemy keeps like half or three quarters of your uh, the money that you pay. Uh, this gives us 97% of what you pay. And, and it's at a discount, so it's a great thing. So anyway, hope you enjoy the course. A lot of people stay away from GUIs because they're so complex. Uh, Isaiah, is, he is a master programmer working with GUIs. And so he shows you in this uh, course how easy it is to work with GUIs. Uh, and so check it out. Cheers. Hi, and welcome to this graphical user interface tutorial. My name is Isaiah, and I will be the one guiding you through this course, showing you how we can create a graphical front face for your program. Whether you're somebody who has never programmed before or somebody who has experience with it, I'm going to give you some tips and tricks that maybe are going to be useful in whatever project you're going to have later on. This course is going to be divided into sections in which I'm going to talk about different topics like what are what is a graphical user interface or uh, what are controls. And later on, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to go into a deep dive in, in which I'm going to show you most of the controls that we have available and how to use them. And during that process, I'm going to show some examples so that you can see how the process goes. So. Thank you very much for choosing this tutorial, and I hope that you find the information that I present here useful for whatever projects you have in the future. In this section, we will cover a few topics, but we will start with what is a graphical user interface. To put it simply, a graphical user interface is what we use to interact with a specific program. You might have noticed that most programs open a window which contains a group of controls that you can use to do different things on the screen. All of those controls are used to gather information from the user or to display relevant results from an action performed by the program. One thing that you have to keep in mind is that programming GUIs is not linear, which means that your code might not get executed in the same order that you wrote it. The code will be executed depending on which button or action the user takes when using your program. In this course, we will go over the basics of how we can create a graphical user interface with a language called AutoHotKey. Even if you are not a programmer, this scripting language is very easy to understand. Before you write even one line of code, the first thing you have to do is create a mockup or a wireframe of your graphical user interface. By doing this, you will be able to take a look at where all the controls are going to be and how they might interact with each other. After you create the mockup, you might notice things that you want to change, add or delete, depending on how it looks like. So it is always good practice to have a mockup available before you even start writing the code. For this, you can use a website called mockups.com, which is an online tool that will let you create wireframes for your application. You're not limited to a website, though. You can use whatever type of tools available to you, like MS Paint or even pen and paper. So long as you have a graphical representation of how the app is going to look like, then you're good to go. They have a free version, which allows you to have 200 objects, which is more than enough for you to create wireframes for different applications that you might work on. If you go to the website, you can just simply create a free account, or if you already have one, just log in. 
in my case, you can see that I have a project in which I have created more or less how this particular act is going to look like. So you can add the buttons and other uh, placeholders so that you can know exactly where everything is going to be. And you can have even different pages. In my case, I use it to create other mockups for other apps. And with this, you can just know exactly where everything is going to be before you even start writing the code. Throughout this course, we will use a scripting language called AutoHotKey. This language is very easy to understand and it is also very intuitive. Even if you do not have any experience in programming, you can follow along our course just fine. Programming languages usually work as a translator between you and the computer. You will write your code in an easy to understand way for you and the programming language will then translate that into machine code that the computer can understand. AutoHotKey is no different. What we will do is that we will use any editor to write our code and AutoHotKey will read that file and execute the commands one by one. Let's take a look at how we can install it and how we can create our first layer program. Installing AutoHotKey is very easy. We just have to go to their website at www.autohotkey.com and select the option to download the latest version. After we download and run the selected file, you will have a selection of how you want to install. It is recommended that you use 32-bit Unicode version as it is compatible with most of the computers. In any case, you can still choose the 64-bit if that's what you need. After you finish installing, there's nothing to run. This is because you will write the scripts yourself, so you don't have to execute any files at the moment. So now that we have installed AutoHotKey on our computers, we can just go ahead and start creating a small program. Now, in this video, I'm just going to go over the basics of how you can do that. And the first thing that you would need is an editor. In this case, I'm using Atom, which is uh, an editor that was created by the guys from GitHub. It is very flexible. And after you install it, you can go and download one of the packages for the AutoHotKey language. And after you have that, what you can do is that just simply click here on the plain text and select the AutoHotKey language so that the editor can actually highlight your code. In this case, what we're going to do is just simply create one of the commands with some words on it. In this case, this particular command will display a box um, with the message hello world, which is what I'm telling it to do. And the most important part is that whenever you're saving your code, it doesn't matter where you save it, but whenever you save it, you should use the AHK extension for the file. That way, after you save your code, you will see that the um, file will have the icon from either hotkey and will allow you to be executed when you double click it. In this case, as our file only has one command, what is going to happen is that when I double click it, we'll have a box that has the message hello world on it and the button OK. And this is actually how we are going to be creating our little programs. We're just going to basically go ahead and open the editor, go ahead and select the commands and actually type the commands that we're going to be using and save in the file as an AHK file. As I mentioned in a previous video, all you need to create your programs is an editor. It can be any editor. If you're not sure which one to use, you can go to the AutoHotKey forums and go to the section for the editors. There, I would recommend Site for AutoHotKey if you're a beginner, which is a very simple editor that is optimized to work with the AutoHotKey language. It has all the basic options and also it has a very clear interface. If you are more of an advanced user, then I would suggest using the AutoHotKey Studio script, which is also a very good editor for AutoHotKey, and it has a lot of advanced options. The script allows you to check your code very easily here on the bottom by splitting it by functions, hotkeys, or labels, for example. 
It has also a lot of commands and advanced options that you can use to help you create your script. One thing that you have to always keep handy when you're creating your GUIs is the AutoHotKey documentation. To get there, you can go to their website at autohotkey.com and then open the documentation page as shown here. From here, you can take a look at the usage and syntax, or you can jump to the quick tutorial if you're a little bit more practical and want to get hands-on experience. You also have a list of all the commands grouped by topic, so you can jump to the one that you're interested in. In our case, we're actually interested in graphical user interfaces, and you can see all the commands that you can use that have to do with that. When you select the specific command you want to see, then you will be able to get a description of each of the parameters, relevant information, and examples at the bottom. In the case that you already have an idea of what you're looking for, you can use the search button and name the topic that you're after. Then you will be able to see all the commands that are related to that topic as well. Sometimes when you're creating your script, you might find out that things are not working as you intended. Just as a quick example, take a look at this script in which my script is going to do a quick loop here and it's going to break when it finds a specific condition and then it's going to show a message box. So if I go ahead and open that particular script, you will notice that seemingly nothing happens. I don't get my message box and some of you might already know what is going on, but sometimes it's not that obvious. The first thing I would do is to check whether the script is running or not. Usually what you would get here is a small icon that tells you that the script is running. So now I'm sure that my script is running. And if you right click on it and click on open, what you will see is the last few lines that have been executed. And what you can see is that it is executing the same thing over and over again. If you click, if you press F5 to refresh, you will notice that it is the same thing. And even if I'm, so it seems to me that the, script is stuck at this particular loop. This is one easy way to find out, right? Another way to find that out would be like closing the script and setting a message box, for example, here. I would put it after the condition is met. So I could just go ahead and verify that message box. And I would say, for example, running. It doesn't matter what it says. What I want to know is that if the loop is actually running this particular message box, inside the loop and what I should I, I would expect it to be shown over and over again until the condition is met and if I keep doing this I will notice like okay hold on it will stay doing that so that's when I would figure out okay hold on it seems to be that this particular script is stuck in this loop and that's because the condition is not being met a index is never the same as status and the reason for that is that status hasn't been defined so i would do this let's say 10 of them and what i would do is that i would just save this and run my script again and again i'm gonna get my message boxes here but after 10 times what will happen is that i will get this the other message box that says task completed and then I get, uh, and then the script exits. So as you can see, the script is no longer running. So basically you can use message boxes to go ahead and confirm if things are working. It doesn't matter what you put in the message box. It's just something that allows you to kind of like visually see what is going on. Another interesting thing that you can do is like, you can just check the value of a variable inside the message box. Like for example, message box, I would say a index and I would set a space here and I would put the other variable, which is status. So my condition is that I, if a index is the same as status, right? So what I'm doing is that I'm just setting up a message box that would show me the value of th both these variables so I can see what the script is looking at. And that is very, is also very handy. So I'm seeing here that my message box says one and 10. So I know that status is 10 
and I know the A index in this case is one. And when I click OK, that number is going to change because on each iteration, A index is being changed automatically. So this is another way that you can use the message boxes to go ahead and troubleshoot if your script is working correctly. Because in this case, if I do not have the status variable, what is going to happen is that I will only see the value for one of the variables. I do have two variables here, but I'm only seeing the value of one. I would right away notice, okay, so one of them is not being set. Which one is it? And I would just read the code and check what is going on. So this is not like very advanced debugging, but it is the most common and most useful way to figure out if your script is not actually working. One of the most important things that we can do when creating a program is packaging it in a way that it can be run in any computer. This is called compiling the program. AutoHot Key offers a very simple way to do that. You just have to right click on a script and click on compile script. This is going to create an executable file that can be run in any computer even if they do not have AutoHot Key installed. As AutoHot Key is a scripting language, this is done in a very quick manner and you do not have to install anything extra to do this or install any libraries or anything like that. You just right click on the script, create compile, and when the other user double clicks on this executable file, he will be able to run your script without any issues. As mentioned in a previous video, programming for graphical user interfaces is not a linear process. To show you more or less what I mean by that in a practical way, let's take a look at this particular GUI. In this window, we have some text, some hyperlinks, and some buttons. When you hover the mouse over some of the hyperlinks, you will notice that the mouse pointer changes. To do that, the window captures some events, and the code that handles the change of the mouse pointer only gets called when the mouse is exactly on top of the hyperlink. In our program, this particular part of the code is at the bottom of our script. It is only called when some specific conditions are met. In this case, the condition is that this code is going to be called when the mouse is over the hyperlink. And this will happen every single time I put the mouse over that particular part of the text. The same happens with buttons and other controls. When I press a button in this window, what happens is that the code that is connected to that button gets called. In this case, only the code that we have is that the window is going to be hidden. And even though that code is in my program somewhere, it doesn't execute unless I click on the button. In some examples, the code can be a little bit more sophisticated, like in this situation, where a list view control is updated only when I type some code on this other control. We will take a look at how we can set up our program to execute code depending on what happens to our control. But the general idea is that this particular part of the code only gets executed when I interact with the control. When you load a window, all of its controls have their own sections of code and they get called depending on the actions of the user. Before we dive into how we can do that, Let's take a look at the main commands that we can use on our hotkey to control our window. To start creating our GUIs, we will be using a command called GUI with the subcommand new. This command tells our hotkey to create a completely new window. We're going to write it exactly like that and then you can set some options and a title for your window. After you type the command, you have to use commas to separate the options and the title like this. If you are not going to use any options, you just put two commas one after the other and then put the title in the last section of the command. We will be taking a look at which options we have available later on, but for now we are going to concentrate on creating the new window with just the title. Now that we have that set up, we're going to create another command, which is GUI show, which will tell AutoHotKey to show the window. Here, we will add the width and height so that we will be able to see the window itself. 
When we run the script, you will see that a new window is created and the title for it is the one that we set up with the new command. As you can see, this is very simple and we just started up with the first GUI. Now that we know how to create a window and show it, let's go ahead and think about another situation that we will look into very often, which is the fact that you might want to create more than one window for your program. AutoHotKey allows you to create uh, as many GUIs as you want. And the way to do this is that when you're setting up a new window, you can set an internal label to it that will identify it with the GUI show command later on, or any other command that has to do with GUIs. Now let's take a look at how we can do that. If we go back to our original code, you will see that um, in the part that we use the new sub command, we can just simply add the name of the GUI. It can be any name, followed by colon. And that will create kind of like a variable, if you think about it like that, that allows us to refer to this particular window later on in different commands. Now, in this case, as an example, what we're going to do is that we're going to create two different windows. One is going to be our main window and the other one would be a hypothetical settings window. So to do that, as I mentioned, we just go ahead and do the same down here. And now each of our GUIs have its own unique internal name. Now later on in our GUI show command, well, AutoHotKey is going to wonder, well, which of the GUIs we're going to show. In this case, for each of the windows that I want to show, I will just simply add the name of the window right next to the word show with colon, same way as we did before. And now I can actually select two of them, of course, each of them is going to be shown separately, and they can have different options as well. And now, when we go ahead and save and run the script, you will see that two windows are shown. In this section, we will take a quick look at which are the options that we have for a window and which styles we can apply to it. We saw that in the new subcommand, we have a section available to add some options to our window. Other subcommands also have the ability to add options to the window, but for now we are going to concentrate on just GUI new subcommand. This list is not going to be for all of the options, but we are going to take a look at some of the most common options that we can use. As the documentation states, it is best to add the options before the use of any GUI add subcommands or any other subcommands for that matter. That helps with the performance of your script. The options can be preceded by a plus sign or a minus sign, which allows you to set the option or unset it depending on what you want to do. That actually means that you can change the options dynamically while your script is running. To start, I'm going to add a quick instruction to AutoHotKey to make sure the script is forced to be opened in one instance. This will allow me to rerun the script really quickly, but you can ignore this command for now. The first option that we're going to take a look at is always on top, written as one word which allows us to set the window to be on top of all the others and even if you click on another window or outside of the program, the window will not be removed from view. Usually, windows are created with a thick border on top and a title bar. If you do not want to use this option, you can write minus caption, which would remove this particular feature. This is great when the window that you're going to be creating is a small dialog and you don't need a menu, a title, or a thick border that contains the options to close and minimize the window. A similar option is the one called Tool Window, which sets a small caption for the window and removes its taskbar icon. 
If you want to be able to resize your window, you can add that option by specifying the word Resize. When you enable that option, you also enable the Maximize button on the caption of the window. All those options are what we call window styles. There are more window styles available, and to set them, you would use the plus or minus sign and their hexadecimal value. Those other styles are not used very often, but you can find more information about them in the documentation. So now that we know how to create windows, let's go ahead and jump to the next stage and let's add controls to it. In the previous example, we saw how we could add different windows to our program, but for now, we're just going to concentrate on only one window at a time. For that, we're going to go ahead and create a new window, and then we're going to use the next command, which is GUI add. This command takes three parameters. The first one is the type of control that we want to add to the window. The second parameter is going to be the options of that control. And the third parameter is going to be the text that we want to insert. We have many controls available in Windows, but for this example, we're only going to use two of them. One of them is going to be a text control, and the other one is going to be a button. So to start, let's just go ahead and add GUI add text. We're going to leave the options blank for now. And the next part, which is the text, is going to be whatever we want. In this case, let's add, this is the text of my control. Below that, we're just going to add a second command and the type, in this case, is going to be button. Again, we're going to leave the options blank and this is going to be an OK button. Finally, we're going to add the show command, but in this instance, we're not going to add any options to this command because AutoHotKey will automatically set the width and height of our window to accommodate all the controls that we have added. Let's save our file, and now when we run it, you will see that our window contains two controls that we have created. As you can see, the button is actually functional, but we haven't added any type of code to it. So it will do nothing right now. Later on, we will go ahead and see how we can interact with this particular control. As you can see, the process is extremely simple. You create a new window, you add controls to it, and then you show it. On the examples that we have seen before, we have used the GUI show subcommand. But let's take a look at how that subcommand works. It takes two parameters. One of them is the options of the window that you want to show, and the other is the title of the window itself. We have seen that we can use the width and height of the window by writing a W and the size for the width, and then an H and the size of the height. You can omit either or, and AutoHotKey will automatically set the other parameter for you. We can also use the letters X and Y and a position in pixels so that you can position the window wherever you want. If you don't specify any of those, what is going to happen is that AutoHotKey is going to automatically set the width and height to accommodate all the controls of the window and the position is going to be centered. Usually it's best to specify the title of the window with the new command so that we can just concentrate on the size and positioning when we show the window. As you can see, this command is very easy to use and is one of the most important subcommands whenever you're working with Windows because it allows you to tell AutoHotKey whether to show, hide, minimize, or activate the window itself whenever you want. In later videos, we're going to take a look at the options that we have available, but for now, we're just going to use the positioning and size of the window with this command. If the user wants to cancel an interaction with a window, you can hide it until the user needs it again. To do this, you can use the GUI cancel subcommand or the GUI hide subcommand. Both mean the same and perform exactly the same action and take no parameters. 
As always, if you want to hide a specific window, you would have to specify its name when creating the window, and then again when using this subcommand. When you use this command, the window is going to be hidden and no interaction is going to be recorded by the script. The window will stay in memory, so you can use it again when you need it by using the GUI show subcommand again. Usually, this command is used when clicking a cancel button, allowing the user to go back to whatever he was doing without saving any information. When the user needs that window again, he just has to click on the button or the menu that took him there, and your script only has to use the GUI show subcommand to view the window again. When you are working with Windows, the user interacts with its controls and later on might want to save the information. We will talk about how we can interact with user input later on, but as a general sense, each control can have a variable in which to store the information that was selected by the user. For us to be able to save that information, we use the command GUI submit. This command tells AutoHotKey that we finished working with this window and that we want to save the information that the user selected. When you use this command, the window is saved and then hidden. As an optional parameter, you can indicate that you don't want the window to be hidden. To do this, you just simply add the word no hide without spaces to tell AutoHotKey that you want to save the information, but the window should remain visible. If you decide to hide the window when the information is saved, you can use the GUI show command later on to show it again. All right, so we're just pausing in here real quickly. I hope you're enjoying this video. Uh, like I said, it's it's only a third of the course. Um, look over my head here to get the discounted coupon. Which side is it on? I get so confused. Uh, anyway. Uh, I hope you're enjoying it. It's a great course from Isaiah's. You know, we worked really hard to get the structure the way we wanted it, you know, have all the best things you can have in the GUIs and simplify it and make it very clear. So uh, keep plugging along. Again, if you like the course, consider buying it. Use the coupon up above, save you some money, make us some money. Uh, all is good. Anyway, uh, keep at it um, and don't give up. GUIs are fun. They're a little painful when you're not used to them, and that's where you just got to keep practicing with them. Cheers. In the same way that when using some of the GUI commands, we can specify some options for the window, we can also specify options for all the controls available as well. There are some options that are general to all controls. For example, the width, height, and size of the controls are specified using the same notation as before. That is, using the letters W, H, X, and Y for sizing and positioning. Unlike the Windows positioning options, the control positioning can be either absolute or relative to a previous control. For example, if we add a button and specify a width, and later on we create a second button, we can either set the X or Y values to absolute values, which can be useful in some specific cases, or we can set the X or Y with the plus sign and the amount of pixels that we want to add relative to the edge of the previous control. This is actually more useful, especially when we're adding a lot of controls. We can also refer to the previous exact position by using XP or YP, which tells AutoHotKey to use the exact XY position from the previous control. With this notation, you can also use the plus sign to use the previous position plus some extra pixels, and that way you can set up a relative layout. This is very handy when you're grouping controls, and we will see some example of this when we use the group box. In all controls except the buttons, you can specify the letter C followed by a color name or a color hexadecimal number to change the color of the text displayed by the control. 
This is very useful for when you want to set the color for only that control while leaving all the other controls in their default colors. In case you want to change the color of all text within a window and set some more options like the font size and weight, there is a GUI subcommand called GUI font. You can find more information about it in the documentation. For most controls, you can use the words left, right or center to specify the text justification. This is perfect for when you want to present information to the users and you want to show everything in an organized manner. Another option that you can use is the hidden option, which, as the name implies, makes the control invisible when you create it. Later on, you can use another command to show that control whenever you want. If you don't want to hide the control, but you want to make it read only, you just have to specify that in the options as well by using the word read only as one word. You can also use the disabled option instead. The difference between read only and disabled is that when using the disabled option, then you cannot interact with the control itself at all. While when using the read only option, you cannot insert new information, but the control works normally. As usual, those are not all the options available, but the most used. If you need more information about them, take a look at the documentation. We will use most of those during our presentation, so you will have examples of how and when you can use them. As we saw previously, you can set the position for controls by specifying it in the options of the control. Most of the time, what we're going to be doing is creating a control and setting another control either below the first one or to the right of the first one. For that, we usually use the X plus some pixels to set the control to the right of the previous control or ignore the Y position to set the control below the previous one. We do have a special option that allows us to create GUI layouts easily. What we can do is that we can set the word section in the controls options. By specifying this word, we effectively save its X and Y positions to refer to it later on by using the notation XS and YS. Think about the word section as the way to save the X and Y positions for a specific control to be later retrieved by the XS or YS options of another control that is not close to the first one that you created. You save the positions of the first control, add more controls, and then when you want to create a new column, you specify YS to refer to the saved position of the first control, effectively creating a new column. You can do exactly the same with the X position to start a new row. As before, you can also use a plus sign and pixel indicators to specify where to set the X and Y positions relative to the one saved before. One of the most important aspects of creating GUIs is to be able to grab the information that the user inserts in the interface and work with it. In a previous video, we saw that we use GUI submit to save the information but that subcommand would not work on its own. For it to work, you have to specify a variable in the control that you want to capture. For that, we use the letter V and the name of the variable that you want to use. It can be anything you want, but it has to be unique. So, as an example, let's set up two controls. One of them is going to be a drop-down list with a few options. 
and the other is going to be an edit control. I'm going to set up a variable for each of them. And now, after the GUI show command, let me go ahead and set the word return. This is because AutoHotKey has a section that executes automatically, and it finishes when it finds that particular word. Now, I'm going to add some code that I don't want it to be run unless it is called by one of my controls. I'm going to set up a button for that. Our button is going to have a special option that we're going to look at in the following video. But simply put, that tells AutoHotKey that whenever the user clicks this button, the following label is going to be executed. The contents of my label are going to be GUI Submit, which will save whatever contents all my controls have in their respective variables. And I'm going to add the option No Hide, so that the GUI is not hidden when I click the button. Now, I'm going to add a message box, which will display the contents of the variables that I already saved with the GUI Submit. I'm going to add one of those for each of the variables. If we run the code, you will see that we get our little GUI. When we select an option and add some text to the edit control and click the OK button, you will see that whatever I had selected on the drop-down list is what is going to be shown in the first message. And whatever I typed in the edit control is going to be shown on the second message box. If we do that again and select other options, whenever I click the button, the information is going to be saved by the GUI submit and the message boxes are going to be updated. So to recap, the basic idea is that for each control that you want to interact with, you have to set a variable to it by using the letter V and the name of the variable. And later on in your code, you must use GUI submit first before accessing the information that the user selected. If by any chance you do not use GUI submit, the variables are going to be made blank. So now that we know how to get information from the user, let's go ahead and respond to it. In the previous video, we saw that we could set a special option to tell AutoHotKey to jump to a specific part of our code. This is one of the options that you can set on all controls. It is the letter G followed by the name of a label or a function. This option, unlike the variables, doesn't have to be a unique value because many controls can call the same label or function. For most of the controls, you have to call the submit subcommand to save the contents of the controls for them to be available to be used later on. There are some controls that are special, like the tree view or the list view. Those controls automatically save the information so you do not have to use GUI submit. We will take a look at them later on. Let's go ahead and demonstrate how we can interact with information. And let's go ahead and create a small GUI. In this one, we're going to get some practice on creating columns. In our first column, we're going to have a list of text controls, which will act as labels. We're going to save the position of the first control for us to be able to create a second column later on. Our next column is going to be a list of edit controls, which is where the user can input some numbers. As we will be accessing those numbers later on, I will set a variable for each of those controls. Lastly, we're going to add a button, and it's going to be on the same X location as the first control, so that it is left aligned. For that button, I will set a label that will be called whenever the user clicked it. Now, I will show the window, and I'm going to set the word return, because this is all the code that needs to be executed automatically. The next part of the code will be only called when the user clicks on the button. 
Now we create our label with the same name as we used in the button. And the first thing that we're going to do is submit the window. I'm also going to make sure that it is not hidden so that I can actually use it again. And with this, all the variables will be saved. What we're going to do now is that we're going to take an average of all those numbers and save it into an, a variable. Lastly, if that average is above some threshold, we're going to present one message. But if the variable is below the threshold, we're going to present a different message. So let's go ahead and test this little graphical user interface. Let's add some values to the edit controls. And let's press the button. Now let's go ahead and change a little bit the values that we entered before. And let's press the button again. As you can see, in very little time you can create a working graphical user interface for your program. As we dive deeper into the different types of controls, you will see that your program can become very sophisticated. Up to now, whenever we want to run code with a control, we have been using a label. For that, we have been setting up an option within the control, which is the letter G followed by the name of the label. Labels on AutoHotKey are very simple to use. You just specify the name of the label, put a colon on it, and below it you write the code that you need and finish it off with the word return. There's another way that you can run code and it is setting up a function. For the functions, what you can do is that you can specify the name of the function, you open parentheses, set up several parameters if you want, separate it by commons, and now you close your parentheses and write the code with braces. At the end, you use the word return. The logical question would be, well, which one should I use? My suggestion is to use labels whenever you're working with GUIs. And that is because, unlike functions, labels can access all the global variables on the script. On our other example, each of the variables that we created are global variables that can be accessed throughout our script. But functions cannot access those variables by default. That is because the scope of the function is local by default. That means that they can only access their parameters and any variables that are set within the braces. For a function to be able to access global variables, you can specify the word global inside it, but that is usually not recommended. In my case, I usually use labels whenever setting a control to remind myself that all the information that is accessed by that label is global. In very special cases, I use a function instead. In this section, we covered the basics of how most of the controls accept options. The most common options for controls are sizing and positioning using the width, height, x, and y positioning of the control. Those options are common to all of the controls available. So as an example, we can set up multiple controls by specifying their size and location and this is how they would look like. Later on, we discussed how we can gather information from the user by using the V option to set a variable to a control. After we have assigned a variable, we could perform actions with the information by using a glabel and the GUI submit command. That way, when the user interacts with the control, we can get information from any of the controls and perform actions depending on their value. We also saw the difference between functions and labels. This would be very useful to decide when to use functions and when to use labels instead. In the next section, we will cover 
what are the window events that are fired automatically by AutoHotKey when some specific actions are performed in a window. Until now, we have seen how we can specify labels on our controls to tell AutoHotKey to execute a specific code when the user clicks a button or interacts with a specific control. But there are some labels that get executed automatically without us having to specify it. The first one that we're going to take a look at is GUI Close. This particular label gets executed whenever the user clicks the X button on the window. For us to be able to catch that, we can specify our window code as usual, and after the return, we can create the label GUI Close. Now, whatever code we write here will get executed whenever the user clicks the X button. So, to test it, let's go ahead and add a message box saying that the user has clicked the close button. When we run our code, you will see that if I click the X button, the message box will appear. The most common use for this label is to tell AutoHotKey to exit the application as soon as the user clicks the X button on the window. For that, we just set up our label and we use the command exit app, which tells our hotkey that we want to exit the application now. When you have multiple named windows, you can actually have different actions for each window. To be able to specify the label for a specific name window, you have to write the name of the window right in front of the word GUI close without spaces. Now, let's create an example with two different windows. Each of them is going to show a different message when the X button is clicked. The next one we're going to take a look at is GUI Escape. The GUI Escape label gets executed when you have your window active and you press the Escape key on your keyboard. You can execute custom coding here as we did with the previous example. Sometimes what you want to do is to execute the same actions for your escape key and the button to close the window. For this, we use a special feature, which is to specify both the labels, one after the other, and then the code that we want to execute. With this, it doesn't matter which of the labels have been called, the code is going to execute the same way for both of them. With this, you can actually create something interesting. You can set up your GUI escape label, add some coding here, then set up your close label, and some other coding here. What is going to happen is that when you close the window, only the code that is below the GUI close label will get executed, ignoring the one on top of it. But if you press the escape key on your keyboard, the code for the GUI escape label is going to be executed and after that, the other code is going to get executed as well. As before, if you have named windows, you just have to specify the name of the window before the GUI escape, and that way you can set different code for different windows. If you just want all the windows to behave the same way, then you just set the labels one after the other, and the code that you want to execute for all of them followed by return. In this video, we will take a look at GUI size. This particular label gets executed when the user minimizes, maximizes, or resizes a window. Whenever this happens, a set of inbuilt variables get set automatically. As a reminder, if you're using a label, you can access those variables by default. But if you're using a function, you cannot access those variables unless the function is set to global. 
there are three variables that you can check. Those are a GUI width, a GUI height, and a event info. The first two, as the name implies, refer to the width and height of the current window that called this label. The third variable contains a number between 0 and 2. If the number is 0, it means that the window has been resized normally by dragging its edges or by clicking the Restore button. If the number is 1, it means that the window has been minimized. And, if it is number 2, it means that the window has been maximized. With that information, we can set the code to act depending on whether the window has been minimized, maximized, or resized by using an IF statement. We're not going to go too deep into that, but you can find examples in the documentation. For now, we will do a small example. We are going to set up a blank window. We are going to set the options for the window for it to be able to be resized. And we are going to show our window and then end the auto-execute area with a return. We are going to create our GUI size label. And we are going to use a command called tooltip to show a small tooltip where the mouse is. I'm going to set this tooltip to the variables from the width and height of the window and then we're going to set a return here. When we run our code and resize the window, you will see that the current width and height is shown automatically. And as we change the width and height, this label is called over and over and updates the variables that we're using. And for that reason, you can see the numbers changing as we drag. As with the other labels, you can act upon different named windows by using the name of the window right before the label name. If your program is going to be acting upon some files, you can catch the event of a user dropping files into the window. For this, we would use the GUI drop files label. Whenever the user drops any type of files in the window, this label gets called automatically. We can use it to grab the name of the file dropped by accessing the variable called a GUI event. If more than one file was dropped, this variable would contain a list separated by new lines of the file paths that have been dropped. So let's take a look at it by running our script and dropping some files on it. We are going to make sure that we're going to show a message box for the a GUI event variable so we can see what the script sees. If we drop one file, you will see that the variable only contains the full path to that file. If we drop multiple files, you will see that we get a list of new line separated paths of multiple files. We can later on in our code either open up the files, move them, delete them, or whatever type of actions that you might want to take. Okay, so we're wrapping up what we've shared from the course. Again, this is just a third of what's in the course. So there's a lot of value still left in the course. Use this coupon above me here if you're interested in getting it. Um, there's also a, a in the course, if you paid for it, there's a bonus lecture, which um, we didn't include here, but it has a document which has lots of great links on where to learn things um, around auto hotkey so again if you're interested you know pay for the course if not that's all right too uh hope you enjoyed it uh we love helping people learn uh this is guis are a great thing that auto hotkey does um so simply because they're basically wrapping the windows gui controls so hope that helps cheers